So I changed the title, sorry. I, I <laughs> made it Supporting Student Equity by Supporting Faculty in the Instructional System. Uh, and in here will be a lot of the same kinds of things that were advertised to you previously. Uh, I don't know how you want to deal with questions. I'm happy to entertain questions as the presentation is going forward. So I don't know if you want them to text you. And yeah, then, as I say, if you have a question, put it, like just say in the chat box, I have a question and then either, you know, I'll stop everyone and ask it there or you can type it directly into the chat box and we'll read it out loud. Would it be possible to just get a sense of who's actually here? Because I yes. only see about four people, so. <laughs> yes. Do you, you want to have everyone kind of do a quick introduction? That would be wonderful. All right, so I'll start. Uh, most of you know me. I'm Blair Schneider. I'm a postdoc at the University of Kansas, and I'm the project manager for this Trestle program. See, Natalie, I have you next on the list. How about you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, Natalie Simper at uh, Queen's University in Ontario, and I manage assessment research here, and I uh, am working on the, the um, Trestle project with Bay and Dina. Hi, Natalie. Amanda, how about you? Uh-oh, no oh. audio. I unmuted you. Hey. Uh-oh, no, oh. no audio. No, yeah, um, there we okay, go. go. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Amanda Modell. I work at UC Davis as a GSR on the Trestle Project, uh, along with Marco and Stephanie. Fantastic. Uh, Dina, will you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Dina. I work with Natalie at Queens, uh, Faculty of Engineering. Uh, I'm, um, I'm, I work on the trestle in the ECE department um, on designing courses and different uh, material and um, interventions in different courses with you in trestle. Thank you. Steve Case. So I'm Steve Case. I direct the Center for STEM Learning uh, at KU. And uh, I do whatever Blair tells me. <laughs> hey, Marco. How's it going, Steve? Uh, Melissa Myers. I don't know. If... Oh, there you go. Hello. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm a laboratory coordinator at KU, and I'm just kind of here to listen and learn a little bit about. Fantastic, thanks. Kayla? Mm -mm, unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry. I just Hello. unmuted you. You're good. Okay. Hi, I'm Kayla. Uh, I am a program coordinator at the Center for Teaching Excellence at University of Kansas. Nice to meet you, guys. Thanks. Uh, Daphne? Hi, I'm Daphne. I'm also a lab coordinator at University of Kansas, just interested in learning more about this. Fantastic. Molly? Hi, I'm Molly McVeigh, uh, postdoc for the School of Engineering at KU. Thanks, Molly. Sarah? I am Sarah Rush. I am the teaching specialist in the physics department at the University of Kansas. Thanks, Sarah. And lastly, Drew. Uh, hi, I'm Drew Varsha, and I'm a postdoctoral teaching associate in the chemistry department at the University of Kansas. Thanks, Drew. All right, Marco. Okay. So, again, feel free to ask questions and you're just text to Blair. Um, okay, so I just wanted to first introduce where this work is situated, and I run the, something called the Center for Educational Effectiveness, and there are three primary areas that we work in. Do you guys see my mouse, by the way, when I move it over the screen? Great. So, one of the big things that we do is really empowering educators. So that is what you might consider your more uh, standard teaching and learning type services where we work with faculty and graduate students and help them uh, be more effective in the classroom and learn techniques and try out things that they would like to try out. We also have something, an area of work that we do that is really innovation and discovery. And that's what Amanda is part of. So innovation and discovery <clears throat> is really related to <clears throat> uh, pedagogical experiments in the classroom and trying to understand how those things can be scaled to different uh, departments, different settings, what we can learn, for example, from hybrid courses in different settings and how they help or not help certain groups of students. That's the type of work that's going on in innovation and discovery. 
Uh, also, Amanda is involved in a lot of work related to uh, helping our uh, professors of teaching, our lecturers with potential for security of employment, trying to understand their impact in the system and what's working and not working with that group. And then lastly, and, and this is kind of a, a blanket one, we're trying to improve educational systems. And a lot of what we do there, it relates to the analytic, analytics work that some of you might be familiar with, like with the ribbon tool. But we also conduct analyses of things that are happening in the empowering educators and the innovation and discovery side and we look at systemic things, uh, for example, incoming student preparation and approaches that have been wor worked on to help that, all the way to, to transfer student success, many other types of, of work. The, the beauty, I think, of our center is that we have the ability of combining these three different areas into one center. We have about 15 people that are staff, and then we have another 15 or so graduate students and undergraduates that help us with this work. And we're fortunate to be able to bring all this together. Okay, with that said, let me move on. Okay, so uh, something I just want to introduce is uh, we are very much trying to, in all of our work, foster a cycle of what I call a cycle of progress. And we're trying to help our faculty and administrators and graduate students be more aware of the students around them. We're trying to help them understand how they might be more effective or work more uh, work more effectively, do things that are more useful to the, to, for the students in terms of their learning. We hope that awareness coupled with understanding will lead to action. And then we'd like that action to be thought about and measured and reflected upon, which then leads to a new awareness and keeps the cycle moving. The reason I point this out is because a lot of our analytics work is really focused on helping faculty and people in the administration be more aware, and also potentially graduate students be more aware of their students. But what we often see is that when they have awareness, they immediately jump to action without really an understanding of what those actions might lead to. So we're trying really hard to make sure that we intervene with supporting understanding before a lot of actions are undertaken. And then we'd like those actions to actually be thought upon. We'd like some data collected. We'd like them to think about what they've learned and how that's changed their awareness so they can continue to engage in this cycle. We engage in this cycle uh, and we've made a conscious effort to focus on faculty, professional staff, and administrators with a lot of the work that we do because we are looking for the leverage point that then affects thousands of students or could have the potential impact on all of our students. Um, because we can see that one person's actions can help spread awareness and understanding. Now, the work with the individuals then leads to behaviors of groups. So these behaviors, these groups can take the form of a curriculum committee or can take the form of a uh, course committee that's involved in the same course or a, or a sequence of courses, um, or can even take place in a department. And then what we see is that the individual's actions inform the group, the group informs a larger system, which then informs individuals. So this is another cycle that's happening where we're looking at this cycle of progress, not only at the individual level, but at the group level, and then ideally, hopefully, at the systemic level. Once this type of cycle and behavior uh, takes place in a large part of the system, then it becomes sustainable. Because what we've seen a lot is when an individual faculty member engages in this type of a cycle, it doesn't mean that their work, especially with a given course, is sustainable. They might move on, they might move to a different course um, and the, all the great change and things that have been learned in, in one setting can disappear. So the only way that we see that that can linger and be sustainable is if it moves at least to a larger group um, behavior and understanding and ideally it moves to the whole system. So I wanna focus on some things or, that we've done in this, uh, looking at some of the analytics and I'll focus first on something that is trying to get at awareness and understanding. This is gonna focus on retention, performance gaps and opportunities, and really the differences between various groups at our university and how we are trying to use that information to help faculty be more empathetic with their students and some of the struggles their students are having. So I don't know if you have this at your university, but in the University of California system, it's become very popular to talk about first generation students. That's been, is, is that, is that been something that other, at other universities is happening? 
I don't know if, if anyone can is willing to or can easily answer. I see something happened here. Let me see if I can get the chat window up too. Okay, yes, AKU. Okay, good. Now I have the chat window up. Um, so one of the things that's happened on our campus is that we've had uh, a program that actually tries to target first generation faculty. So try to bring them together because they have that experience, see how they can then connect with their students. What happened is we brought some data to this group. So this is about 200 faculty that have, have come regularly for a quarterly meeting about first generation faculty and first generation students. And one of the things that we've seen is that when you look at retention into the second year, and this is indicating to you at the very beginning, we have 100% of the students remaining. And this is looking at aggregated cohorts of students that started at different years. <clears throat> but retention into the second year for our first generation students starts to drop. And by the third year, you have some drops. And by the fourth year, again, the first generation students are less likely to be retained overall at our university with the males first generation students being the ones that are uh, most likely to be lost. So this is something that we brought to their attention. And of course, they were interested in trying to figure out what could be done about this. <clears throat> and another thing that we did is we looked at how well are the students doing in terms of their academic performance in terms of GPA at our university. So what we looked at is we were able to bring to them this information that on average, um, after the first year, the GPA of non-first generation students is up here is around 2.95 at the end of their first year, whereas the first generation students have an average that's more like 2.5. So this was interesting, got them discussing why they think some of these differences might be there, but we were able to bring a little bit more insight into, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this is the grade point in, for five introductory courses. This is uh, Intro chemistry, intro calculus, uh, economics, intro economics, uh, intro psychology, and uh, I think it's intro physics. I have to go back and look exactly which one this was. So what we did though is we said, well, you know, first generation students can also be many other things. They're not necessarily just first generation. So we were trying to look for intersectionality. And so what we did is we said, okay, well, if we look at students that are first generation only, but are not low income and not underrepresented minorities, this is where their GPA actually is. They're more like 2.82. This difference isn't as great. If we look at some other factors, if we look at first generation and low income, they move here. If we look at underrepresented minority and first generation, they move here. If we look at first generation, low income, and underrepresented minority, they move down to 2.15 now as an average. So there's actually an intersectionality of these factors. You can't just say first gen, non first gen. There's actually much more going on and these factors are repeatedly working together. Now, I don't know about at your university, but at our university, it was a lot easier to talk about this from the starting point of first generation versus non first generation. It, first generation topic seems to not be one that raises a lot of hackles, raises, you know, the, the people don't get upset in talking about first generation, not first generation in the same way that they might get upset if they were talking about first generation and underrepresented minority, you know, underrepresented minority issues or low income issues. It's much easier to talk about first generation. Everyone can kind of understand what that might be like, or a lot of people seem to be able to understand that. The moment we bring in some other areas, you start to see that the picture is not so clear. It isn't just this first generation thing by itself that's the dominant factor, there's actually intersectionality with other factors that are important. So <clears throat> then what we did is we went on and started to understand how does our students' behavior, how is it affected by these various combinations of factors and opportunity? So now I'm gonna introduce these names of triple and not triple. So this is looking at all courses at the end of the fall quarter. So at the end of the first quarter, the students come to the university and it's looking at not triples. So not triples are the students that are not low income, not first generation, not underrepresented minority, and comparing it to the students that are all three of those things. 
in just their first quarter average grade point performance. So you see there's a big gap. And then what you see is if they only have one factor, they end up lining up over here, kind of clustered together if they're only first gen, if they're only low income, if they're only underrepresented minority. If they have two factors, they end up being clustered over here. And if they have all three factors, they end up over here. So effectively, what, it, what is happening routinely, and I can look at this after one quarter's performance, top uh, large courses the first quarter, I can look at performance at the end of the first year. This behavior, this pattern is consistent. And you see this, these different groupings that all line up together. No factors, one factor, two factors, three factors. Okay, so we were trying to figure out how might that be explained? So something else that we took advantage of at our university is that for the state of California, we have something called the Regional Opportunity Index. And this is work done by our Center for Regional Change. It's not a center that we have here on our campus. And what they did is they said, can we assign the opportunity a zip code provides to its residents? And what they did is they created two factors, two average numbers of opportunity, one for the people and one for the place. If you look at the people factor, it's made up of all these factors that you see here. It looks at educational factors, elementary school truancy rate, economy, people employed, housing, people who own their own home, mobility, transportation, households with broadband, health and environment, social political engagement. So they have a measure that they call the people opportunity of a zip code. And then they have another measure that they call the place opportunity of a zip code. And again, it looks at similar dimensions, but it looks at different metrics. And what they've done is they've mapped all these opportunities to the zip codes in California, okay? And what you see is places that are more red. This is the, the people index, and this is the place index. And it gives you a sense of the aggregate opportunity for health, safety, uh, education in a given zip code. So what we did then is we said, okay, if we look at how our students are doing as a group in, these, in those different intersectionality metrics, and we see what is the zip code where they came from, how well do those things align? And what we see is very much a similar alignment. The not triples on average have very high people means in terms of opportunity for their zip code. People with only one factor kind of lumped together with the people with only one factor, their GPA. People with two factors lumped together with their GPA. People with three factors are at the lowest. And we did the same thing for place mean and we see some similar behavior. So I don't know if you get this at your institution, but our institution is growing ever more diverse, not only in uh, ethnic diversity and racial diversity, but also in diversity of preparation. And a lot of our, well, a, a portion of our faculty want us to see us not taking certain students because they're not prepared. We shouldn't be taking them. And they, they think these students are not ready. They're lazy. They don't want to work hard enough to, to meet the standards that we have here at the university. And so they're trying to make the access standards more stringent. Well, Part of what this analysis helps me to talk about with them is that, look, as a group, your students in these different categories actually are performing in accordance with the opportunity their zip code gave them, <laughs> okay? So they're not lazy, they're not incapable, they're not unwilling, they're basically just performing in a very similar way to their socioeconomic and local factors of where they grew up. So my question has been, what can we do to help the people who did not have a lot of opportunity by the time they get to us have opportunity with us? And so we're trying to develop right now an inventory of student opportunity that we at the university actually contribute. So if we know that our students come in with a range, a broad range of different opportunity levels, we hope that the university could bring that range, tighten that range. 
we hope that the university would provide more opportunity to the students who have had less when, before they got to us. And so we're trying to understand where opportunity the university is contributing is actually going. Because it's unclear, I don't know if you have this at your institution, but at our institution there are so many disparate programs to try to help students. It's unclear, we, we, I mean, from our end, we're starting to hear some students say, I, I was bombarded. I came in and I had emails from eight programs trying to get me to join. Which one should I join? How do I know what's, what's right for me? How do I connect it? Is it worthwhile? Is it worth my time? There's a lot of confusion. And we're also seeing some students that don't get access to any of the opportunity, even though they probably should. So we're trying to build this idea of who is getting the opportunity, what opportunity are they getting, when are they getting it, and what kind of dosage of that opportunity are they getting. And the types of opportunities we're looking at are things like first year small class experiences, special programs, do the programs they go into, do they have very clear course learning objectives in their syllabi? So we consider a clear course to be an opportunity. A course that has clear outcomes is a greater opportunity than a course that does not have clear outcomes. Can we start to measure these things? Are they taking co-courses to help them with, with improving their performance in the course? Things related to community engagement. Do they have access to peer mentoring, learning assistance? Do they have access to research experiences, internships, campus employment, things like this. We're trying to create an inventory of the global experiences our students are exposed to so that we can have a better sense of who's actually taking advantage of campus opportunities. Okay, <clears throat> so now I'm gonna to talk to you about something with awareness, understanding, and action. Uh, actually, I should first ask, are there any questions about that first part? I just uh, wanna say that data was, I don't wanna say it's awesome, it's not good news, but at the same time, like, it's just so good to see that data and to have that evidence. Yes. Now, I want to be clear, just, just so, you know, for, for disclosure, full disclosure. Yes. If I look at every single student and I say, what is their zip code opportunity and how do they do as a, as a GPA, it's not, the correlation isn't like a beautiful one-to-one -one correlation. There's a lot of variation in the group, but the group behavior in terms of how they do at our university is very much similar to the group opportunity. Okay. The if I go by the each individual student and link them together, the R squared, the correlation R squared value is about 0.12. Okay, so from a social science perspective, it's something. From a STEM science perspective, it's nothing. Um, so I, I, I just want to be clear about that. But the group behavior is very much tracking very, very well together. Okay, so just, just, for, just for clarity. How do we collect first-gen status data? <clears throat> It is something collected to the university. We have the mother's educational level and the father's educational level, or however the parent setup is. Um, and we know, uh, in, in this case, first generation is defined as never completing a higher education certificate. So they could have had one or two years of uh, community college, but just never completed a certificate. So that would count as still first generation, their, their progeny. Um, Marco, I had a question. It, it was interesting to me how the retention was definitely affected by gender. I was curious if there was any similar, if, if gender influenced the GPA data as well. Okay, good question. So uh, we've gone much deeper into the groups and the gender. And yes, there are courses where the gender is strongly affected. For example, introductory economics. There's definitely a, a lowering of GPA for the women in all of those groups. Um, sometimes in some subgroups, we will get a gender, um, a gender effect that is counteracted in the other groups. For example, in some places, um, in some places, the how should I say it? In some places, the triples, the women do better than mm -hmm. the men. Uh, in, some, in quite, a, quite a range of courses, but not all. So if you start to look at the, and I can, since you're right here, I can show you, I have data that can show you for the very specific courses, the male-female split. We see some interesting behaviors, male-female, but we also see some interesting behaviors with our English second language learners and our international students, where in some places they're seeing a benefit that's different, you know, they're, they're seeing differential benefits. Because we do have first-generation international students, for example. And we have a lot of first-generation ESL students who can also, are also often underrepresented minority and often also low income. 
So we do see some effects there that are different. Uh, for example, we see big gaps uh, in introductory psychology for English second language learners. Makes sense. Uh, and so, you know, so it's not just the, the more traditional STEM courses like calculus, you know, math, things of that nature. Okay, I have a question here. Did you take into account incoming academic ability? Uh, SAT, ACT into account. Okay, so in the analysis you saw, that is purely raw. Okay, we have done for specific courses, term by term gaps, where we have taken into account prior academic metrics. What we see is for some courses, introductory large scale, introductory uh, STEM courses, large introductory STEM courses, for some of them, the, the SAT um, measure, even just that one alone, accounts for 95% of the difference, okay? In some courses, it only accounts for 50% of the difference. The big challenge here has been, how do we interpret that? So does that mean that if I teach a course where there's a 0.8 GPA gap between triples and non-triples, but it's almost completely explainable by the incoming SAT, does that mean I'm doing a great job? Unfortunately, transcript numbers are what actually matters in the outcomes for these students. It's not the adjusted. <laughs> we don't get to say, well, you know, you had 0.8 lower, but when we adjust for your SAT, you were actually right up there and you got that 3.0. We don't get to do that. So we've had this struggle in, in um, and, and the way one of my, our biology teachers, uh, professors who uh, I interact with quite a bit, what he said is, does that mean we're just as biased as the SAT in the way we test in our class? That was kind of, uh, you know, his response. Others say, oh, if I match that way, then I've done my job. I can't do miracles. Um, but then the other question comes up. In some courses, I can only account for half of that difference. So what's going on there? Is there like outward prejudice? Is there a, uh, a use of examples that are biasing and are, are, are causing stereotype threat? Is there some other behaviors that are going on there where I can't account for it by the SAT? You know, so it's, it's an interesting question and I would love opinions. I would love thoughts on this. This is an area of, of conversation that uh, can get quite rich. Um, and is our job really to A certain group of us believe that our job is to promote equity, not equality. So equity would mean really trying to raise those GPAs as well of those people, because in the end, access to the next course, access to um, uh, graduating so that you can go on to professional school or graduate school is, is dictated by that raw GPA. Any other questions? Okay, I'll take that to move on. Okay, so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to build faculty supports so that we can connect faculty, staff, and administrators. And this is part of a project that we're doing uh, with Howard Hughes Medical Institute, their Inclusive Excellence Project that we were awarded and started this project in September. So what are we doing here is we're doing something that we call MIDAS, or the Multidimensional Instructional uh, development for achievement and success system another lovely acronym but really the thing that I want you to focus on is we're trying to build a dashboard of information to help faculty know who their students are we're trying to bring in teaching strategy tips both at a very short digestible level to a more couple of page level to the actual bibliographies with links to the research we're also trying to connect the faculty to an instructional support community, which involves other instructors who have expertise in a given area, but also campus supports that have expertise, and you'll see some examples in a moment. We're also trying to help faculty do instructional exploration and help them with their data gathering. And we're trying to get all of these different things to support that cycle that I was showing you earlier. So this tool here is primarily supporting awareness. <clears throat> These types of tools and the, and the support community is to help with understanding. Okay. <clears throat> um, 
faculty will take an action and then this instructional exploration data gathering is trying to help them with reflection. Um, and then we're trying to get to facilitate the condensation of this information into a teaching portfolio. And that teaching portfolio is meant to be used when you go up for your merit and promotions. It's a additional supplementary information. I don't know if this is true at your institution, but from the lots of different places I've gone to, this seems to be a pretty universal piece that faculty will say, yeah, that's great. I should do that for my students. I should be better at this. I should try to work on that. I should, but my institution won't reward me. But my institution won't give me any bonus for that. And the other thing that's pretty universal is we don't like the student evaluations. We don't think they're accurate, that, that are reflective of what's happening in our classrooms. What we're trying to offer is additional information to help you document a faculty member's reflective practice. We're trying to capture reflective behaviors in their teaching practice into this teaching portfolio. Now, I'll, I'll qualify by saying this project started in September, <laughs> okay? So it's a five-year project. So we are, we are learning as we go along, and we have a very um, vibrant community of 20 faculty that are helping look at these tools. Now, let me show you what the Know Your Students tool does. The Know Your Students tool will tell you for any course that you're about to teach or you've taught in the past. So we're in a quarter system. Our quarter starts at the, basically at the beginning of April. Right now there's information about the courses that you as a faculty member will be teaching in April. Okay, and there's also all the courses you've taught in the past. You log in and you find out this is the class size you got. This is the ratio of male, female. This is how many transfer students you have. This is the percentage of first generation. This is the percentage of low income percentage of minorities, international, academically distressed students, repeaters, the experience the students have at the university, and this is your English second language learners. So that's one part of the information, and I'll show you in a moment we can drill in. It also tells me how many students are first-year students, their freshman admits first-year students, second-year students, how many are transfer students, um, and if I click on the ESL students piece, let me see, can I go back? If I click, for example, on, on this box here on this lens, I would get this information and it would tell me, oh, I'm teaching the section that has 28% ESL students. One of my colleagues is teaching section B. They have 31%. One is 18, one is 24. It also tells me of the terms I've taught, what has the profile looked like? Like, is this class that I've gotten particularly similar or different from what I've taught in the past? And then I can scroll through five years. I can't scroll in this example, but in the actual tool, I can scroll through five years of that data. Now, this is a first generation opening. And now I've clicked on something called uh, research, uh, teaching tips. And now I can see, I have all kinds of teaching tips and I click on the tips and I can get a longer tip. And I can also, now in the, in the latest version, can also go to the background literature if I wanna really read something in depth. So I'm trying to help now with the understanding of what you might do in your class. If your class has a lot of first generation students, what are some things you might do to help um, have a better outcome with your first generation students. And it also will connect you to resources that we have. For example, this is a resource we have on our website. We have a four part series on supporting first generation, first generation students that has been written. And we have many others in different topics. And this is just one type of resource we might connect you to to help you with your understanding. Okay, now we also wanna connect you. This is what it looks like, by the way. This is part one. Um, it's three pages, and these are the other parts, the first pages of the other parts. So different things, different strategies you can think of along with references of what you might do to support first-generation students. And then if you want to go to the annotated bibliography, you can also go to the annotated bibliography. Now, the other thing we want to connect you to is not just things that we have at the Center for Educational Effectiveness, we want to connect you with other faculty who have tagged themselves as being particularly interested or expert with first-generation students or with English second language students, or we have a faculty member that uh, has had a lot of expertise working with low income students. So we are now building the system to connect the faculty to each other in a way that isn't onerous for the people who identify themselves as experts, in a way that they can be kind of a, a, a blogging approach or an approach where there's a message board. Uh, there's a quick question, who created the resources? Um, by resources, uh, we created the tool, 
we create the, those written resources, but we're also now connecting with, for example, resources for Native American students, African American and African Student Success Center, Chicanx and Latinx Student Success Center. So we're connecting with the different professional staff. We're connecting with things that are on the web. And all of these folks will be, are, are able, will be able to, because we haven't built that part of the tool yet, but we'll be able to contribute their resources. So there's a one-stop shop for the faculty member to, they're teaching this course, this is relevant to their course, here's the things they can connect to. That could help them if they want to focus on area of their course. And then what they do, there's kind of like a quick journal that they can fill in that becomes part of their teaching portfolio. We haven't quite automated the connection of the resources into the teaching portfolio yet, but there might be some things that we can automate there. And also, by the way, connects them to the, for example, the tutoring center, the Student Academic Success Tutoring Center. Okay, if you move down into Know Your Students, it also tells you what are the majors your students have and what year in school are they in, what are the courses that they're concurrently taking, and you can ask for how did the students do in prerequisites of my, of my course, and it tells me how they did in the prerequisites and when did they take those prerequisites, so you know how fresh those prerequisites are in your student's mind and how they did. So did they take them within a year or more than a year? And then it also tells you if you go, if you don't look at a course that hasn't happened yet or is happening right now, but you go to a course in the past, you can query the system and say, how did my students do in the next course in the sequence? So if I teach the A course and I taught it two terms ago, I can go in and say, how did my students do in the B course? Okay, and you can see kind of how they performed. And in this case, somebody who teaches 2A, taught 2A students, biology 2A, the first course, is checking to see how did my students do in 2B? And when did they take it? One quarter passed or two quarters passed? <clears throat> taking it with me. So they also get a sense of how their students are performing in whatever course they want to pick. Okay, so the other thing we're doing is now adding data sources into Know Your Students. So things like DART, and I'll show you an example of DART in a second that measures audio level in the classroom. You can put COPUS information. You could put, uh, we're going to feed back and say how many of your students are getting tutoring. We'll have that in near real time. So you know if your students are getting tutoring and where on the campus they're getting tutoring so that you can connect with those groups to make sure that the tutoring they're giving is actually relevant. Um, we can do Bloom's analyses of any kind of textual elements that you have in your course that you'd like to see the kind of Bloom's levels, the language is promoting which Bloom's levels. We could have, we could have do an automated time on task survey. If you want, we can look at gradebook analysis for gaps and targeted supports. Uh, how well are certain behaviors affecting the gaps between certain groups, like the gender gap or an international student gap? And you could look at it by assignments, and of course, <clears throat> um, linking you to campus resources. This is an example of the DART analysis. An instructor wanted to have more interactivity in their classroom. So they were very actively trying to get more student-student interaction. And so all we do is we measure with an iPhone the sound in the middle of the room. And then we run this through this DART uh, program at, at CEPL, that is at San Francisco State University. And it basically gives us a profile of this is when there was single voice in the, in the recording. This is when there was multiple voice, single voice, multiple voice. And we can do this every single time and then generate a report of was there repeated ongoing interaction? And how frequent was this interaction of the students? And then the faculty can put that condensed bit of information into their teaching portfolio. They can say, I wanted to increase interactivity of my students, and this is one measure that I have that I did it. <clears throat> Another thing that we're doing is we have a tool that allows us to tell you, in, for example, your course learning outcomes that you communicate with your students. Are you asking them to mostly remember factual things? Are, we can do an analysis of the words and try to help you think about that. So just to end, I want to say that we're trying to help the faculty go from a state of relative lack of information, engage in this cycle that I was mentioning. Oops, sorry, this arrow is pointing the wrong, oop, this arrow is pointing the wrong direction. And we're trying to give some clarity to the instructional approach. Okay, so with that, I will end my presentation and welcome any questions.
you mentioned earlier that you took steps to make the teaching portfolio effective. Um, okay, so the teaching portfolio, I have, to, uh, I have to be clear, the teaching portfolio is something quite new. It's something that we're trying to right now just capture ideas as faculty are trying new things. And we are working with our faculty advisory group to try to understand what information do they think would be most valuable. Teaching portfolio is a purely voluntary uh, piece of the project. Faculty member, it's completely optional for them. If they want to use it as a means of documenting their reflective practice, that's what we're welcoming and that's what we're trying to foster. Um, it's just very beginning. We're adding some pieces in the teaching portfolio. Uh, we, we are helping, um, you know, they can document what they want to document, but in, it, we're trying to get this captured so that next time they teach the same course, they can go back and reflect on what they also, the notes they wrote the prior time. So it's kind of an ongoing log. And we're now still trying to figure out how we abstract key experimental data or key information that they've, that they've um, kind of mini experiments they've done in their class to feed that into the teaching portfolio. Anyone else? I was going to type, but I'm a really slow typer. I'll turn my video on. Um, that uh, you mentioned that there were 200 faculty. Um, in, in the first gen group. In the first gen group. So uh, did, was that like 200 of them turned up at a one-off event or was, what? can you just speak to that? Yeah, there's an event that um, happens every one to two quarters. There's the biggest event is usually the one at the start of the year of the academic year. There's one within the first month of the start of the next academic year to bring in new faculty. Um, but then we try to also sometimes we try to do also one kind of in the more in the middle. So one or one and a half quarters in, we also try to have another event. And that so, event is, is right now featured on so far, it's been like, let's get to know each other. Let's start to have some discussion. Let's share. The last one was, let's share some data so you can start to understand the complexity of this problem. Because what you start realizing is you get these folks in the room, and a lot of them are not just first gen. A lot of them are first gen and minority, or a lot of them are first gen and low income, or a lot, you know, and, and they start to realize that also the students that have re reached them, because we gave them all t shirts, and we invite them to, on the first week of class, wear their t shirt. And so what that's brought about is students coming up to their faculty member and asking them and saying, I'm also first gen and starting a conversation that way. I'd say the t-shirt has probably been the most effective thing, to be honest with you, um, in terms of building interactions. And what's, what we've also seen happen now is we're bringing in stories of first generation students that have made a connection with their first generation faculty member. For example, a research connection or working with them on some kind of project and we're featuring those now in the meetings. So in the last meeting, we had three different pair pairings that were featured and to, to try to give ideas to the rest of the group on how they might take advantage of, of this program, this first generation connection to go, go deeper. Sorry, something else. Does that answer it, Natalie? Oh yeah, no, that that did. I was just uh, being quiet in case somebody had something else to to, to throw in there. I I was just staggered at the number of uh, first generation faculty members. I guess it's self identified, uh, and because what I heard when I first heard it was a uh, new faculty, because we'd have two hundred new faculty here at Queens each year. But I'm wondering how many of them wouldn't have now. When you say first gen, you don't mean their parents haven't been in like a degree higher education you mean they haven't been faculty members or no, or no 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 i mean we have that many first gen who are the first in their family to go to college and get oh, a degree. that's just amazing uh, that it's a very different climate here i would imagine we have a very small first gen student population so um i guess I don't know, I wouldn't even like to take a stab at it, but it would be nowhere near 200. So that's very, very interesting. Now that's not 200 
starting faculty members, right? That was a call made to the whole faculty. So right now that's roughly 10% of our faculty, our first gen, but chances are there's more. And we do not keep that data, meaning we, we don't have university records when they applied if they were first gen, right? Not in the same way we do for students. We don't ask them their parents' education and their, so it, it, they're self-identifying. So, but, but you're right, I've seen large variation. In California, this is pretty common. Like, and in the UC system, this is pretty common. Okay, well, we've been making this tool available to others. Um, that is our intention. I'll tell you that, um, I'll tell you, Sarah, that it's not so, you, you still need to have some programming support. You have to have access to the right databases. You need to have a connection with your registrar. You need to have a connection with your admissions data. Um, so yes, we will, we will happily make the software infrastructure available, but there's just a lot of pieces underneath that you have to instantiate to make it work. <laughs> and that part we can't help you with. I mean, we can, we can tell you how we did it, um, but the, the way access to data works is so dramatically different at different campuses that, you know, that's where most of your time will be, I'll tell you, is getting the right access to the right data in the right time frame at the right speed to be able to do it such that it's valuable to the faculty in a meaningful time frame. Other questions? Somebody else has a question. I'll jump in again. Um, so I'm most interested in demonstrating the value of uh, high impact practice like this, and um, and I'm and I'm curious if you've had any ideas on how, other than the anecdotal or the interviews or the feature, which are all very um, qualitatively effective and those stories, those, those narratives between individuals are incredibly effect, uh, effective at, uh, ex at telling the value of what it is that you're doing. But I, I, I think that uh, some of the more quantitative metrics tend to hit home with those that have the purse strings in my experience here. So, I mean, this type of program, I imagine, costs money to keep running. And I'm wondering if you had any forward plan on, on ways to demonstrate the effectiveness of using data for improving outcomes for students, because it's a really hard link to make. Okay, so number one, um, we're starting to release it on a larger scale in the fall. And part of getting access to it, the faculty member will have to uh, answer some questions that help us think about their instructional, their base, kind of some of their core instructional beliefs and uh, something about the culture around instruction within their environment. Okay, so the idea is to measure that on a yearly basis. We also will know who's actually using the system. Part of accessing the system is that we have the right to know who's using it, not to feed back to anyone else, but for the purposes of if you're using it and then we look at your survey, you know, we don't want to look at your survey if you never use it <laughs> because part of, partially we're trying to figure out if you're using any of these connections, if you're linking on the resources, if you're, you know, we don't know how much time you're spending doing these things, but we'll have some, at least some sense of, are you accessing it? Are you going a little deeper into some of the resources? Are you using the teaching portfolio? You know, things of this nature. So one is we have an idea of who uses the tool. Another is we'll have multiple uh, yearly time points of general teaching practice, teaching beliefs, teaching culture. So that's the instrument we're working on right now. Uh, also with um, a researcher and anthropologist at Carnegie Mellon is also helping us think about this. Um, who has done a lot of interviewing with faculty about like how their teaching behaviors are affected by their beliefs and by their early, like it's like they, what's their origin story is kind of the way she calls it. Um, so we're trying to look at that so we can capture the culture change because really this is about culture change. It's a, if I can figure out if, if there's more reflective practitioners and if being a reflective practitioner is actually valued in your department, that's one measure. Another is as people start to use the teaching portfolio, once we have that developed better, 
are they actually being successful? Like is, is, can we get any feedback on if that's useful to the merit and promotion process? That's another measure because we want to know that it's of use to them, right? Because if you think about it, if people start coming out of the experience and saying, this was useful in my merit and promotion, you can imagine that will affect other people wanting to try it, right? So that's another in, uh, measure that we're looking at. Uh, of course, we have the individual stories, and you're right, stories can be very powerful uh, tools, but we, we want to get the bigger picture. The other thing is, once they engage in doing some kind of experimentation, like collecting something about their experience in that class that they're monitoring through Know Your Students, and we make that feedback loop pretty simple in terms of getting the information back to them, we can start to look at the impact of some experiments on student outcomes in that course. So we don't have it fully fleshed out, but we're getting pieces that we think will have some, some power uh, to make it sustainable. The thing we were worried about is that any kind of change that we made that was funded by a grant that had a big grant component like this, when the grant ends, how does it keep going? And our basic premise was, if faculty see this has a value to their advancement, that is probably one of the strongest forms of sustainability. Because the cost of operating the system by that point will be quite low. The support we already do as part of our work of our center. So it's not like supporting faculty is a new thing that we're doing just because of this tool, right? We're just connecting them to the supports around campus, including our own supports. So we're going to feed in, if you did a mid-quarter inquiry on your course, we'll feed that information into Know Your Students and it'll be part of your teaching portfolio. You know, a teaching observation, basically. If you've done that, the information will be in there. It's also a place to aggregate the work that you as a faculty member are trying to do on a course to try to improve student outcomes. We, again, I don't, what I'm really trying to stay away from is, you know, have you reduced all gaps in your course? That's the only way you get a, you know, you get a big gold star. No, are you even paying attention? Like that's, I want you to get a gold star for being reflective, a reflective practitioner. That's what I'm hoping gets rewarded. My fundamental belief is that if we have more reflective practitioners, overall student outcomes will improve. But that is uh, an assumption that I, ha I don't have a lot of data on at this point. No, I tend to agree, and I with that assumption that you're making. I, I just, um, I guess, I'm a bit of a, um, a a skeptic when it comes to others believing, and so um, being able to uh, demonstrate that this is valuable. I mean, I think that was the as a great uh, response. You know, what proof of the pudding is it goes on once the funding's not not there. But um, I also liked the. Um, the model that you had uh, individuals with expertise feeding into like sub, I guess communities of practice yeah. in uh, a particular um, uh, focus or interest area and that sort of that sort of work does need to be held together like it there needs to be the, the glue like and and whether it's a you know like an actual person who's a a choreographer of those meetings or food for those meetings. In any case, they cost money. So I, I like to try and find any hints or, or uh, possibilities for demonstrating that it's worth, it's worth spending the money on. And I think you've got some great ideas there. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll just echo the sentiment. This was excellent, Marco. Thank you. Oh, thank you, I really, really enjoyed this topic. Good, good. And if you, if any of you have any other questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, just uh, I will put my email right here. And I just wanted to make sure that I, I saw Stephanie joined in too. I didn't know if she was there earlier, but and I did, I didn't hear you at the beginning, but Stephanie also works with Amanda in our team and she's our associate director for the instructional innovation and discovery. Wanted to make sure you guys all knew her. Uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me and I look forward to um, seeing you guys at the next trestle meeting. Okay. All right, everyone. Thank you.